Oh, g'day. Welcome for joining us online. Thanks for coming with us. I, I was just having too much time. I had a good time chatting because, ah, oh, kids are back at school. It's not a sadness. It was just, this was a sadness, wasn't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, I was away last week because it was school holidays and I spent a week with uh, the kids, which is really, really good. So thank you for... Uh, giving me the space to take that time off. It was refreshing. It was wonderful. Thank you very much. And thanks to the team who ran last Sunday. Appreciate it. It's a lot of work, and I understand that uh, it takes uh, commitment. So thank you very much for helping us out last week while I was away. Now, today we're starting a new four-week series on Paul's letter to Titus. Titus is in Crete. It's exciting times. I'm really looking forward to doing this new series with us. I haven't done it before, so that's exciting for me as well as everybody else. You excited? Titus. Yes. It's going to be good. I know. Uh, for those who are... What's that? I said I was rolling my eyes. Ah. I'm ex- see, because I'm a newbie, if you, if, you, if you don't know, I'm a newbie, and each time I do a new series... It's a new series. I haven't done it before, so it's really good. So uh, welcome if you're here, if you're watching uh, uh, later on a recording or if you're here with us on a live stream, it's great to have you with us. If if you're watching us for the first time, my name's Samuel. It's great to have you here. We believe that God has and continues to speak to his people through his word, the Bible. God speaks to his people. He is not silent. He is not distant. He is not an absent God. And we're convinced that as we listen to God through his word read and taught, his Holy Spirit is with us and working in us, not just to make us know more, but to be who we are made to be, godly people. So we read the Bible, we think about it deeply. We are not ashamed to do the hard work of understanding it. We let it shape how we think about ourselves, how we think about each other, how we think about the world, and we allow God's word to shape how we relate to all of these things, how we relate to ourselves, each other, creation, but most importantly, how we relate to God. We believe that through Jesus, our standing before God has been restored. We're no longer his enemies. And so we can talk to God. And trust that he listens with an attentive ear. He's not distant. He doesn't, he doesn't shun us. He doesn't go, oh, yeah, but I knew what you did last week. He looks at us as a father who cares for his children. And so we come to God in prayer. We trust that he is good. We, we know that he wants us to pray to him, that we ought to talk to him in prayer. And because of who God is and what he has done, we want to honour him. And so we sing songs. We shout and sing and declare our joy in him. We declare his praises. We we declare how good God is to each other and to him. We worship him. But we also learn to live a life of obedience. We want to be people who reflect who God is in our day-to-day life. Here at Warhope Prezi, we're about Jesus. So I'm really glad that you're here today. Let's talk to God in prayer. God, you are good, and you have demonstrated your goodness to us since, well, when I say us, I should say you've demonstrated your goodness forever, since before time began. And yet, Lord, we see your goodness in perfection in your Son, Jesus Christ, Jesus, our Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God. So, Lord, help us to learn to honour him, to love him, to live for him, to listen to him even now as we listen to your word, the Bible. Amen. Thank you, John. Uh, Now, take a deep breath. Feeling strong? They're looking at me as if I'm weird. I don't get it. Today we have a very long reading. Four verses. I don't normally do this, but uh, it's, it's the natural break in the talk. So, uh, feel free to look up Titus towards the end. Great. Thanks, Lillian. Morning, everyone. Today's reading is from Titus chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, 
promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Saviour. To Titus, my true child, in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Saviour. Well done, thank you. Before we open God's word, let's pray. Lord, you are good. Help us to trust you as we listen to your word. Help us to hear with a fresh heart. Amen. I can say with confidence, we are not in the majority. Definitely not. We are, even though we're a wide range of ordinary people, we are called to a very different view of the world. This is actually much more important. One of the fundamental things that make us so unusual, so different, and let's be honest, even weird to some people, is that we know something. We live according to a truth that they do not. We are not home yet. In Jesus, we belong to a new creation which has started, yes, it started in Jesus' resurrection, but it will only come to its fullness at the return of Christ our saving King. In Jesus, we have right now a new eternal life. It is completely, utterly different. It makes every difference in how we live. Problem is, the world is so shiny. The world is shiny. It promises so many different ways to be happy, to be fulfilled, to live the self-authentic life. And it grieves us when our parents, our sisters, brothers, our children, they look to the eternal hope of glory that's offered by Jesus and yet they still turn away from that true light to the shiny trinkets this world holds out to them. But it's not just them, is it? We all feel the pull in different ways. The pull to live our way rather than to live the way of the Lord Jesus. So how do we hold on? How do we hold on to a greater hope, our greater hope, when there's so many distractions, there's so many demands, there's so many things pulling us in different directions away from Christ? How do we hold on when the world tells us we're missing out because we don't play the field as young adults? How do we hold on when the world tells us we have to find our own meaning? We find our own purpose. The world that tells us we can tread on anyone who challenges our view of self. How do we hold on when people who claim to be spiritual, religious, to be influential, whatever, when they offer us a path away from the true gospel? Because the paths to hell are many path to eternal life is narrow and only a few find it. How do we hold on? Well, thankfully, we hold on the same way the new church in ancient Crete was to hold on. We're told how to hold on because they are facing the very same challenge. For people who grew up on the island of ancient Crete, life was pretty wild. There's a map of it. See, it's an island. It's, it's in the middle of this is, uh, it's an intersection between two major uh, bodies of water and it's got these wonderful trade um, harbours, uh, safe refuge for ships doing their trade routes between major intersections in the ancient world. It's, it's a major centre in naval life and shipping life. And life on this island, man, it was pretty wild. This is, this is wild country. In their own day, Cretan... Uh, culture was notorious for its treachery, for its violence, for its, um, shall we put it, licentious behaviour. In fact, one of the ways to describe a liar in the ancient Greek world was to call someone a kretidzo. You want to call someone who lives a life of a liar? Well, literally, it's to be a Cretan. That's how bad they were. The ancient world knew these guys. 
and such was their reputation for scraping the bottom of the morality barrel, it was into this place, this space that Paul and his mission team established a small network of churches. Can you imagine that? Just find the roughest town you can find, the roughest area you can go, right, this is a great spot for the church to grow. That's where he heads. Can you imagine how hard it would have been for brand new Christians growing up in a culture where life was cheap, Treachery, get this, was glorified. The, the, some of the writings from this area, what people did to each other, is just, it, it's spectacular. It, it would it'd make, well, less and less so, but even make modern people blush. It was just terrible. People outcompeted each other in debauchery. Imagine growing up in that space and then to have to wash our mind clean of all we thought we knew and try and take a clean hold of Jesus. And so Paul while he and his mission team, they, they established this brand new network of these small churches in Crete. He has to move on, but he doesn't want to leave them on their own. So he leaves behind his valued co-worker, Titus. Now, you've heard Titus before if you've read some of the other letters. Here's Paul's big go-to man. All right, remember how he had to send a letter to 1 Corinthians? He had to send a, a, a bit of a stern letter. And then uh, Titus, is, 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 he's the strong arm that goes in to deal with issues in churches. And Paul's thinking, I need to leave a very experienced, very capable person behind to help this young, vulnerable church to be strengthened, to be organised, so that this young church might grow into full maturity. And this is a tough gig. To become a Christian, to set up churches in this culture, it would have been really difficult not to assimilate their own ideas and understandings of their previous gods with Jesus. It happens all the time, even still. Uh, particularly their chief god, Zeus, who they believe was born on Crete, right? He's their own. He's the head god, right? And he thinks they belong to him. And uh, Zeus, what kind of so-called god was he? Does anyone know? Zeus, what kind of reputation does he have in the Greek mythology? He was a liar, a swindler, a schemer. He would lie and cheat as he went on his adventures seducing women. That's the life of their great god, Zeus. And Paul's concern is, how does he help these Cretan Christians let go of their old understanding of life, their old understanding of the gods and what they were like and their priorities to truly see who Jesus is? He wants them to let go of their old, treacherous, licentious way of life and learn how to live in a Jesus-like way. Or as Paul puts it, to live according to godliness. And so having left Titus behind to establish this young church, Paul writes back to him from his next area of mission, which was the Nicopolis. And Paul begins his letter with one very long sentence, as Paul has, yeah, as, as Paul is, is wont to do. He can hold a lot of ideas in his head at one time. I can't. I'm breathing and talking at the same time. I'm doing well. Right? I'm, 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 I'm at the edge of my capacity here. All four verses, even though there's a capital um, in it, which makes it look like a new sentence, look at the semicolon before. It's not actually, it's, it's all one extended sentence because all Greek letters were basically written, Samuel to Frank, uh, God's bless you, right? Now on with business. You'd say your own name to who you're sending it to and a brief greeting or a blessing in the name of the gods. And Paul, he can't help himself. It's like a lot of teachers, apparently. They're just like going on and on and on and on and on and on. I don't know where he gets. Uh, 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 totally random. No one else does it that I know of. And so he takes his traditional Greek greeting. Oh, I said that correctly. And he blows it up. He kind of gives us an insight as to where this letter is going in his introduction. And it's interesting, if you compare different letters that Paul writes, how he changes how he introduces the letter is a really good clue as to where he's going. So it's not a bad idea just to look at his introduction and go, right, what are you doing to us today, Paul? Or to this church that needs helping out? So he fills it with meaning. We're going to break it down a little bit because uh, it's too much for me to hold in my head. So let's, let's do it piece by piece together. Let's have a look from verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul, as he, remi- as he describes himself, he doesn't say, uh, 
Paul, currently staying in the Copolis, now he says, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus, he's reminding Titus and the church who, by the way, will listen to this letter as well. Gets read out aloud in front of everybody. He's not writing simply as a friend. I'm not writing as a mate, Titus. I'm writing as someone who labours for God. This letter is a work that I have been commissioned to on God's for uh, yeah, as required by God. I'm labouring for God, even as I write this letter. And more specifically, I've been appointed as an apostle for Jesus, our Messiah. I'm writing to you, Titus, as one who's commissioned by Jesus himself. Commissioned with the authority of Jesus to instruct you, Titus. And through you, the members of the whole church there at Crete. And as a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus, he writes for a purpose. So again, he's still describing himself, right? As a servant of God, as an apostle of Jesus, why do I write? To help God's elect, those who are called and chosen by God. This is who you are. He can't help himself but teach, can he? That's, you're not just a little Christ, a little Christian, a little Jesus. You are called by God, chosen by God, elected by him. You belong to him to help God's people do what, he says? Put your faith in God. The God of creation. Not the so-called gods of the Greek world. I want you to turn to God in trust, to trust that God's way is the best way, because that's what trust is. We can trust God. Yeah, I know God's real and go and do whatever we want. That's not faith. Faith is to know who God is and allow who God is to shape everything about our life. I'm going to trust you, God, that your way is better than my way. Turn to God in trust. Trust that God's way is the best way. A faith, a trust which is built not on myths, not on wishful thinking, but to build a faith in God on the foundation of truth. Huh. Crete's not so very different from today, is it? As we listen to those around us, it's hard to tell who's telling the truth. He hear so many very firm opinions and different things and arguments taking place. And it's, oh, man. Same, Crete, people delighted in lying to each other and deceiving each other and being treacherous. God is not like that. God is a God of truth. But Paul is he's an apostle of Paul. Oh, sorry. Paul is an apostle of Jesus. He wants to point the elect God's chosen people back to the truth of God. And he seeks to build their faith upon the truth that they might do something, that it might mean something to them. <coughs> well, he wants them to have what naturally comes from a genuine faith and knowledge of the truth. You see why it can't be a head thing? What does it do? It accords to godliness, a godly life. You see, how we live, how the Cretans are to live, it's not shaped by the gods of the world around us. How we live is not shaped, it's not to be shaped by the expectations of others around us. <coughs> How we live is not even shaped by the social and moral imperatives of our day. And I tell you what, we are really heavily impacted by our culture and what's normal around us. Think about what's normal in Crete. That's terrible. Think about what's normal in our culture. Is it any less terrible? We are not to be shaped by our space. But we are to let our faith in God and the knowledge of the truth lead to what accords the good, godly life. Life that reflects that truth, that reflects that faith, that we're saying that, God, we believe that you are true, regardless of what everyone else says. No matter how well intended, there is no other way to live a godly life. Just going to go on the side here, sorry, Jill. We can think something is right so desperately and want it to be good. But God might say, I'm sorry, it's not. Or we might think something is bad and horrible and oppressive and terrible and yet God will say, no, 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 this is for your good. 
trust me. We can't trust what our culture tells us because our culture is headed for hell. We must allow Jesus and the truth, the knowledge of the truth that God gives us to shape how we view this world and who we are. And it's really difficult because sometimes I don't even know I think something until I've been challenged by it as I read God's scriptures. Go, what? Really? We have to let the knowledge of the truth and our faith in God lead to what it should lead to, godliness. Yeah, where am I up to? Sorry about that. In all the cultural pressure these Cretan Christians are under, Paul wants them to know and understand God's truth, God's wisdom. He wants them to trust him so they can walk in a way which pleases God. This is the core. This is what is the heart of Paul's letter to Titus. Now, have I said Timothy yet today? Because each time I see the word Titus, I say Timothy in my head. So if I do, just flip those two names around. I'm working really hard getting this right. But this is the core of Paul's letter to Titus. He wants them to trust in God, know the truth, they may live a godly life. But knowing what to do and how to do it, sometimes that's not enough to get us up and going. I mean, I know that too much sugar is not good for me. Anyone at home group last week would have noticed that I certainly did not put that belief to effect. <laughs> I was even thinking that afterwards. I was like, eh, well, I really did a bad job tonight, didn't I? Um, we know that too much sugar, not enough exercise is not good for us. But what's going to change our heart so that we want to eat well more than I want that extra biscuit? Man, that's a battle, isn't it? How, how, do, I, how, how do I change my head and my heart so that I want to live well? Because I know something here, but it doesn't necessarily mm, give me the energy, the joy, the delight in being who I am called to be. We also need to know not just the what or the how. We need to understand the why. Not just in our heads, not just in our hearts, but both. We, what will motivate our heart and mind to, for us to hold on, to keep trusting in God, to submit our will and our works to him through thick and thin, through, through being challenged in our worldview by being told by God this is good when we hate it, or God telling us that something we love is actually wicked. How do we trust him enough to allow his will to shape who we are? You know, when the world around us is glorying in their self-rule, when they're delighted in their independence from God, how do we hold on to his way when it can be so costly to follow the Lord Jesus in truth and godliness? What will stir our hearts and minds to choose Jesus over whatever it is, minute by minute, day by day, year after year after year? Well, Paul doesn't leave us guessing. It's that in Jesus we have a greater hope, a much better hope confident expectation. We have a much better expectation. We know where our future lies. We have a hope this world cannot possibly give. Eternal life. Paul was called by Jesus himself to build up their faith and knowledge of God in the hope, in the confident expectation of eternal life. Eternal life promised before time began. Before creation in the will of God, this is huge, the Cretan church, because their old gods were as deceitful and capricious as anybody else, except just on steroids, right? You can trust this God and this God's promise, because he's not like your gods and their promises. This God is true. He never lies. And he has made a promise since before creation began. A promise of eternal life. God doesn't treat truth like a commodity. It's not like our culture. God, the Father, the creator of all things, he has called his chosen people to a promised eternal life and you can be sure of it because he has said it so. God always speaks the truth. 
He always does what is true. What he says, he does. Every time. God is true. Imagine that hearing that as a Cretan, right? With lies and deception and the capricious gods just, just permeates through the whole world. To know that there is absolute truth. And that God is true. And he will never lie. And when he promises eternal life for the elect, his chosen people, it's as good as done. It's our hope. It's our confident expectation. It's what makes it all worthwhile. Have you had to give something up for something really good? Have you had to endure something really hard? I was actually talking to someone just before the service about how hard it was to earn money as a farmer, right? Uh, you had to put up with a lot to earn not much. It's amazing what people will do for a future promise. Hey, kids, if you're watching at home, um, anyone here heard of a uh, touch a car contest? It's not very big in Australia. Touch a car contest. What they do is if somebody needs a big promotion, what they'll do is they'll get a, a moderately priced car, not a very expensive one, a, you know, but a nice one that people want. And they say, hey, if you can hold, if you can touch this car the longest, it's yours. You get to drive away in it. And so what they do is people would you know, they enter into a lottery to, to be one of the 10 or 20 people chosen to do it, and they all have a start time, and then they all, three, two, one, and they're all hands. And so if you take your hand off before someone else has, you lose. You, you have to walk away. How long do you reckon people would stand there or sit there touching? You can't remove your hand. Your hand has to stay on the car the whole time. How long do you reckon? How much would you last? How much would you last, do you reckon? How long would you go for? For a car. Come on, have a guess. How long would you go for? A couple of hours. A couple of hours? Yeah, you'd last a couple of hours. Yeah? Someone else? How long? If it was a Lamborghini, three hours. Lamborghini, three hours? Man, I'd go longer than three hours. There are bathroom breaks. So every four hours you get ten minutes. Four hours. Four hours. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, now, we talked about truth and how hard it is to find truth in our modern culture. I do know these are real competitions. I've seen them. As to which one went the longest, take this with a total pinch of salt. Right? <laughs> but they reckon someone went five and a half days. They had to stay awake, or at least functional enough, to keep their hand on. Imagine you wouldn't want to go to sleep, would you? He kept his hand on the car for five and a half days. There was another one where they had to sit in the car. I think this was in Australia, actually, this one. Who would want to drive away in a car that's had all these people sitting in it <laughs> for that long? Ooh, it would have got rich in there. Um, <laughs> deal is, whoever touches the car the longest gets to keep it. But what God promises is so much more than a car. Car, it's going to wear out one day. It's going to fall apart. Don't give yourself for a car. That's ridiculous. What does God promise? God promises us a life which will never wear out. <clears throat> now, a few of us are feeling a few aches and pains of things wearing out right now. But we are promised a life that will never wear out. Eternal life. God, from the very beginning, planned to make everything new. A new creation where Jesus is king, where God's chosen people will be able to live safe in his care forever and ever. Grab a hold of that. Don't grab a hold of a car. What, would we will, what are we willing to give up or to put up with for that? Paul was an apostle of Jesus because he wanted people to have this hope, this promise of from God who never lies. We don't place our hands on a car. We hold tight onto God's promises. We trust in God. We grow in the knowledge of God's truth. We work hard at it. We labour in it. We don't care that it's tough. We do our best to shape our hearts and our minds according to his will because we trust him and we don't give up leading godly lives because, because we have hope of eternal life. It's worth it. God promised before the ages began 
from before time itself. But I wasn't there when he first made that promise. Were you? No, you all look much too young to have been there. I mean, there's no way. You can't have been there before the beginning of time when God promised. So if we weren't there, how do we know about this promise? How do we know that God is true? How did these Cretans, how would they possibly hear about this wonderful promise, this wonderful God who is always true? Well, at just the right time. We don't get to pick that, by the way. I, my, the assumption is when God decided it was just the right time. When God sent Paul and his team, who did what? Who preached God's word? The truth we are to know, that we are to put our faith in, in the hope of eternal life, is God's word. So for the first time we get a clue as to what this truth is that is going on about here. This isn't the truth that E equals MC squared. As fascinating as that is, you don't need to know. What we do need to know is this gospel message for which Paul is an apostle. Paul who, actually the, the language there, he says, even I, Paul, he, he kind of emphasises himself, think about who Paul is. Paul who used to hate God is now a preacher of a word. He... he well, he loved God, actually. I shouldn't say that. He hated what God was doing through this Jesus movement. This guy who hated God's work through Jesus is now a preacher of God's work through Jesus. He's a preacher of the word, not his own, but God's word entrusted to him by God himself. And Paul, he doesn't have a choice. He's not claiming credit here. He's not going, oh, I chose for myself to be an apostle. No, no, no. I was commanded to go by God. Um, do you remember Jesus meeting up with him on the road to Damascus? That's kind of a solid slap on the back of the head, wasn't it? Anyway, it's here Paul returns for the purpose of his apostleship. Paul's been commissioned by God to preach God's word and it's with this authority that Titus is to rely on to communicate and insist on what Paul's going to instruct in the next few chapters. And I'll tell you what, it's not light. The pretty significant demands that Paul is laying down on this church community. A church to live in a different way to the rest of the world. In a way which is radical in the face of every expectation of that culture. In fact, pretty radical in the expectation of our culture. And it's also why we sit up and listen. As God's chosen people, we don't get a choice whether we listen or not. It's not a matter of you know, flicking to our favourite channel or favourite news feed. No, we don't get a choice whether we listen or not, whether to obey or not. We're to read and listen to this letter from Paul to Titus and the church in Crete because we are also the church of Christ. We are also being called to faith in God as we read this letter. We're called to the knowledge of the gospel truth that we might live godly lives in the hope of eternal life. And so Paul, the Jew, the Pharisee who once persecuted the church, concludes his greeting to Titus. Titus, by the way, who is not a Jew. And listen to how Paul, the ex-Pharisee, concludes his greeting. Verse 4. To Titus. My true child in a common faith. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Saviour. Again, some themes there we'll pick up later in this letter, but that's for next time. Let's pray. God, we, we get a, a taste and a hint of the challenges we're going to face in Titus. We live in a world that's not too different in the West, where truth is a commodity, uh, morality more about signals and proving to be on the right side of whatever. Lord, our, our, our world is a mess. And it's very hard not to be messy with it. Lord, help us to listen. Help us to be shaped in our faith that we will put our trust in God, in you. 
Help us to listen that we might grow in the knowledge of the truth. Not what we want to believe, not what everyone else says is true, but what you say is true, because you're the creator of the universe. You made it. What helps to trust you, to listen to you, that we might be godly. We might live in a way that pleases you, that you approve of. We want to honour you because through you, you have sent Jesus, our Messiah, our Saviour. In him alone, we have eternal life. But help that to be real in our day-by-day decisions. Help it to be more than just a knowledge in our head, a, a sentence in our mind that just drifts away. Help us to live with eternity in our hearts. Because you've promised it. It's going to happen. Lord, help us to be a people who are not ashamed to follow Jesus. Amen. Oh, rock youth. I forgot to ask. Oh, there's only two. Hmm. Hmm. Ah, oh, yeah, you can still hang out with Ian. That's still a good thing to do. What are the three questions, Ian? Do you remember what the three questions are? Yeah, what stood out from the What stood out from the talk? What's the other one? Do you have any questions? Have any questions? And what are you going to take home? What are we going to do differently? What are we going to take home from what we've talked about? Hey, adults, what a great set of three questions. <laughs> mm, sounds hmm. familiar. does sound familiar, doesn't it? Thanks, guys. Let's head out with Ian. Thanks, guys. Take a seat. What a hymn, hey? Not a bad one to print off when you get home or look up again and just see how rich those words are and how they reflect even just Paul's opening sentence in the book of Titus. Wonderful words to remind, remember, remind each other of. Mm, Struggling with my words now. Sorry about that. Hey, if you're joining us on Facebook live stream or recording, thanks for being with us. Leave a like, share, comment get back to you. Uh, thank you for being with us here. You know, we are here every Sunday morning, 9.30. Sunday? Sunday. Here at the Warhope Country Club in the auditorium down the bottom. We'd love you to join with us if you're able to. Um, watching the service is great if you can't go to a local church service nearby you. But if you can, that's what we're called to. It's actually our church family, our community that shapes each other as we love each other and worship God together. Super important to be in person if you can. If you can't, it's great to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. Uh, next week on Titus, we're going to look at the rest of chapter 1, where Paul begins the task of helping Titus help this church grow into full maturity in a very hostile space, to be godly in a hostile world. But more on that next week. Can I recommend that if... Um, no, Take away the if. Let me recommend, <laughs> read through the whole letter of Titus. It doesn't take long. Do it a couple of times. Maybe do it a couple of times each week. Maybe a couple of days. Sit down, just read through it. It won't take very long. And get the whole book in our hearts and in our minds. It's got some cr- big challenges in it. It's, it's, it's got some tough bits. But remember that opening of Paul. He wants the knowledge of the truth. Now trust in God to make us live a godly life. And even though it's challenging, that's what we're called to. But we'll talk more about that next week. For now, let's trust in God. Let's grow in the knowledge of the gospel truth that we might live godly lives in hope of eternal life. Let's close in prayer and then we'll finish up with the live stream. Ah, God, thank you that you are good. That we don't put our trust in a capricious so-called God. You are not us. You're not like us. You are perfect, true, good, just, merciful, forgiving, righteous, patient. You are all of these things in perfect measure. Lord, help us to trust in you when you tell us how to live in godliness, how to be different to this world, to stand out, to live a way that will encourage our neighbours, our friends, our colleagues, our our, our clubmates, whoever it is, to look at us and say, why are you so different? How, How can you speak that truth? How can you make that declaration? How could you live that way? How could you forgive? Lord, help them to look at us and not see us, but to see Jesus. 
that we might be like you, the good, true God who never lies. Lord, help us to keep our eyes on eternity that you've promised for us. I thank you, Lord, that there will be a new creation, a new heaven and earth. We're here in the new creation. We will get to see you face to face and you'll wipe away every tear and we will know that it was worth it holding on to Jesus. And so it's for his glory, for his reputation's sake that we pray. Amen.